Everybody hear me back there? I hear it a little bit. Need to go up? Sarah, could That's you, uh, you're on it? All right. I thought you were cashing somebody out over there. Cash. Check, check. Hello? Good. Signs on tap. Signs on tap. Signs on tap. All right, there it is. Signs on tap, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for uh, bearing with our, our sound check there. So um, this is uh, our... I think we're starting to get the, the, the rhythm of the cellar here. I hope all everybody's really excited and, and enjoying the room. I'm, I'm blown away by how well it works out for Science on Tap. And again, kudos to the brewery. Well done. Uh, I think, so, so is anybody here that doesn't want to be? Let's finish that. Whoa. No? All right. Good. No, That's a good start. <laughs> yeah, well, you better stay then, I'm afraid. Yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> All right, well that, that's good because you're in the right place then. So if we have newcomers, I want to give you a little uh, heads up as to what Science on Tap is all about. It's, it's a, a program to make uh, some of the research and science that's going on in the Flathead Valley and uh, beyond approachable and, and give uh, researchers and, and scientists a chance to sort of communicate and, and discuss their work in a really approachable and down-to-earth way. So we're off of the old ivory tower situation and into the uh, bar room. So it works out quite well. Uh, and and, and it, we really try to make it really accessible. So uh, usually we have a good presentation and a whole bunch of questions. So I encourage you all to, uh, if you think of a good question, please please ask it when the time comes. Um, we have this, uh, Science on Tap is a, is a partnership. We have the brewery hosts us. And they're really gracious and, and wonderful and give us a, uh, a donation for every dollar or every, uh, for every pint that gets sold. Um, and that helps us really keep things going. We get the website up. What? Right. So there's a caveat. But every pint that gets sold down here uh, during this time goes to uh, help us keep, keep the website up and kind of um, provide, provide a meal for the speakers. Uh, so it's a wonderful arrangement. And, and the... The arrangement also includes the Flathead Lakers and the bio station, Flathead Lake bio station. So this is a, a cooperative and it, and it really is about the science and bringing science to the people. So I hope you're all ready. Um, do the Lakers have any announcements? Not really, except, there you go. except we're always looking for new Flathead Lakers members. If you are not a member, I encourage you to become one. Um, you can become a sustaining member for $5 a month. That's almost nothing. And it keeps our programs going, like the Becoming Watershed Citizens program, like Citizen Science and Science on Tap. So I encourage you to become a member if you are not a member. Um, and there are ways to make it affordable and easy. Thanks. Couldn't be better. Couldn't be easier. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that, with that said, I don't think the bio station has anything new other than we're really excited to uh, have Bob take off his stream ecology hat and put on a beer hat. Uh, it's a helmet with two, two cup holders. Uh, what? Yeah, it might be the other way around on a typical day. But <laughs> um, when we first kind of came up with the, the, the premise or, or bringing the science on tap to the brewery and we started speaking with them about maybe hosting us, I got really excited because I thought immediately, there's a lot of science that goes into beer brewing. There's a whole lot that goes into the decisions and, and the styles and everything's founded in a bit of science. So I was really excited to, to bring a, a, a talk and I, I didn't realize that it was gonna take three years or have such uh, high caliber folks. So we're really excited to, uh, to bring up, um, and you know, one thing that I should mention is that I was really excited that we had such a good brewery to talk about uh, beer here in, in Big Fork. So that's a, a major plus. And even over the last three years, it's been going great. You still guys are still at it. So um, we're really excited to, to bring uh, uh, a couple folks up here to give a talk on the science of sour beer. We've got Bob Hall, who's a, a honest... Um, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna make a joke about your beer drinking, but uh, uh, who's, a, who's a, 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 a world leader in stream ecology, but he also happens to be a world leader in understanding and being able to talk about beer. So we're all in a very, very uh, wonderful place, and we also have the man himself, the the expert in the house here. Dave Brengard, did I say it right? Perfect. Uh, wonderful. Who's the, the brewmaster here at the brewery, who, who's uh, crafted all 
or it continues to craft all of the delicious beer we're all drinking. So without further ado, let's talk about beer. Cheers. All right, thanks, Sean, for that introduction. Uh, I will start the talk, and then David's going to do the fun part at the end where he talks about how these beers are made. And the reason why it's going to be fun is because that's when y'all get to drink his beer. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll do that we'll do that uh, we'll do that a little bit later. Uh, what is this picture you're looking at? This is the bottle aging room at Cantillon Brewery in uh, in Brussels. And so they just take these big niches in the wall. They just stack these things up full of beer uh, beer. And then. Uh, and then, uh, so it's talked by me and then David who is uh, over here and does this stuff for a living. Okay, so sour, how many people have, somebody told me tonight they've never heard of sour beer. How many people have never heard of sour beer? Oh, okay, so a few, all right. How many people, they, they would prefer a sour beer over another beer? All right, I see you being in that. Uh, a few others here, okay. So we're in, we're in between being, being huge fans and so this is just a range of sour beers that you can buy. Uh, some of these you, in fact, can't buy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, at least they're very, at least they're very difficult. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is how how do we how do we make these and what do they taste like? And but I promise you, there's going to be some science in here. This is science on tap. There, there will be some science. Uh, all right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about the history. It's difficult to make beer not be sour. We're going to talk about pH because that's what sour is, and nobody seems to understand pH, including college undergrads. Um, we will talk about organic acids that make beer sour. We'll talk about bacteria and uh, and certain yeasts. So we will uh, we'll give a little bit of microbiology lesson. Then how do we make these sour beers? Uh, and then what do these things taste like? And so you guys are going to get to do that later with some uh, with some samples of sour beer from here. Okay. So before before modern brewing, yeast was this assemblage of stuff at the bottom of fermenters. And brewers quickly figured out that if you took this stuff and then you added it to the next batch of beer, you would it would ferment the beer. And they would do this for batch to batch to batch, and they would give it to their friends, and if the batch was bad, presumably they would throw it out, um, and then they would start over. And, uh, but it was difficult to keep these beers from being sour. And it's because these things were, uh, they didn't have proper sanitation like we have now. Uh, and, they, uh, and, they, and, the, and the yeast cultures were really yeast assemblages. And so it was yeast and bacteria, uh, in these beers, and so it was a mixed culture, and they didn't have a way to identify and pull out pure cultures. That's what we do now. And so we'll take a single cell culture of Saccharomyces that we like, and we, we just propagate these things over and over again. Um, now what's interesting is they may, these beers may or may not have been sour. There's some question as to how sour they were. Some were probably tooth ripping sour, others maybe others maybe not so much. Uh, interesting fact though is that during this time, even though they're even though they are even though this is an assemblage, we were domesticating yeast strains. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a, it's a domestic creature. Uh, okay. And so some of the early sour beers here uh, is from Bruegel. Uh, this is a picture, and this is from the 1500s, and there you see somebody pouring Lambic into its typical jug down there in the, in the corner. So this is a painting called The Peasant Wedding, and, uh, and so there is uh, Lambic beer, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about how Lambic, is, uh, how Lambic is made later, but that's a classically Belgian specialty. Um, so this is something that people in Belgium have been making now for many, many years. Okay, so sour is hydrogen ions in water. Where do these things come from? And so I promise you there'd be some chemistry. Don't worry, it'll go on like this and then it'll get worse. Um, and so here is some water, and what this does is it dissociates the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl ion right here. In reality, this is what happens. Two waters bind with a hydrogen ion form this um, hydronium ion plus the hydroxyl, but you'll never see this written. It's almost always written this way right here, and uh, and so in pure water, the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide are 
are really, really low, and they're roughly equal to each other, because what happens is water will dissociate, and a small amount will form this, and a small amount will form that, and that concentration uh, is 10 moles per liter. And so, 10, excuse me, 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. It's been a long day. So, 10, so it's a very small concentration. What is a mole? Uh, a mole is six times 10 to the 23rd atoms. It's a count of atoms. And so it can be a count of atoms, a count of molecules, a count of charge. And so one liter has 55 moles of water in it. And so, so and this is one 10 millionth of those 55 moles is dissociating at any one time if it's just pure, if it's just pure water. But luckily beer is not pure water. And, uh, and it varies a lot. And it can vary a huge amount. And so pH can vary by one, uh, by one quadrillion. And so the pH can be very, very low, and it can be very, very high. And so a low pH, so the pH of the beer most of you are drinking right now is this, 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter. And we'll call that a pH of 4. 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter is pure water. 10 to the minus 10 moles per liter might be the stuff that you clean a beer tank with. And that is, uh, and that's, so that's got a lot of hydroxyl ions in it, but not much hydrogen ions, very, very low. So you might be noticing a pattern, 10 to the minus 4, 4, 10 to the minus 7, 7. What pH is, is it's 10, it's uh, the negative logarithm, the negative base 10 log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So that's what pH is. How many people remember this from high school? High school chemistry. I don't even remember it now. Okay. Yeah. How many people? Yeah. Right, I'm not going to ask you how many people remember high school. Uh, so this is this is this is this is old school chemistry, and so we do this for brewing. This is also what I do at my job on a daily basis. And so the pH scale is really, really uh, broad. And so here's the pH scale, go from zero, this is super nasty, that's a battery acid right there. A pH of 14 is, the, is liquid drain cleaner, so that's, that's caustic solution. And it varies in between. And so uh, your blood is close to neutral, here's all these different things. Now the fun thing is that beer, I just told you, is pH of four. Sour beer is pH of three, and you might be thinking, well, that's not, that's not a big difference, is it? Boy. Somebody, is that a big difference? Yes. Yes. Four and four and three? Why? Yeah. Why? It's a logarithmic scale. Because it's a logarithmic scale. All right, Sean, how many times more acid is this percent? <laughs> One thousand. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> how many what times more acid is three and four, pH three and four? Ten times. Ten, oh, ten times. times. Ten, ten times. times. Yeah, it's the base, the base ten log. So this is ten times more acidic. Beer is low pH, and you're glad that it's low pH because it keeps the other microbes out. So even clean beer is still kind of, it still has some sharp sourness to it. But it's really down here is where it's going to get more sour. So this is sour beer. So you're going to be drinking stuff right down here tonight. Okay. So what are the acids that make this? How do we get this acid in beer? And so here is one acid. This is acetic acid. And so here is acetic acid. And what happens is this is what's called a carboxyl group right here. This hydrogen that's stuck to this oxygen is free to leave. And it dissociates when it's in water. And some amount of these things dissociate, leaving behind the acetate ion. And then over here is the hydrogen ion. So if we take uh, acetic acid and add it to water, it will become <coughs> low pH. And so, uh, so this acid is, uh, this is this is the definition of an acid. It's a proton donor. It's a hydrogen ion donor. And that's one of the acids that you'll find in beer, hopefully not too much. And so what are these? And so one of these, and we're going to taste a bunch of this tonight, is lactic acid. And lactic acid is not sharp. Uh, it's a, the big one, in, it's a big acid in sour beer. It's very, very common in sour beer. Acetic acid is vinegar. Uh, and so that is vinegar, and you can smell the acetate ion. So that's why for wine drinkers out there, that's called volatile acidity. So if you've ever been to a wine tasting and they and they start showing how much they know about it. Like, oh, I get a little VA out of this. What they mean is they smell, what they mean is they smell vinegar. Um, 
How many people have had that happen before? <laughs> I've seen it. I've heard that too. <laughs> Uh, there's other acids, succinic acid, malic acid. Uh, this is in fruit beers and cider in particular. So if you drink cider, it's full of malic acid. Mm -hmm. And then uh, citric acid, also in fruit beers and some also from the yeast. We'll talk about these two acids mostly. Um, if we were talk if this were a wine talk, we'd have tartaric acid down here. That's another another common one. Um, so what is lactic? So this is a this is a a very clean sourness. Uh, it's softer than citric or malic acid, which is why when you drink wine, uh, the, you, uh, white wines will oftentimes, oftentimes go a malolactic fermentation where the malic acid would get converted to lactic acid, which is softer. The, some of the bacteria and, and beer make, uh, make lactic acid, um, but it's pretty high concentrations in sour beer. And so the way we make this is from pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid is part of glycolysis. And uh, you're all doing that right now. And so that's when you take a glucose molecule, split it into parts, and then take it apart as part of respiration, uh, cellular respiration. You all are doing that. And pyruvic acid is after you take that six carbon glucose and split it into pyruvate. And so here we have pyruvic acid that then will become lactic acid. Um, and so, uh, so lactobacillus will make lactic acid out of this. This won't accumulate in beer because it's a meta metabolic product. The lactic acid is the end, is the end result there um, because, they've, uh, because they've harvested more energy out of the pyruvic acid. Who does this? Some bacteria is lactobacillus pediococcus. We'll, we'll bring those guys on board in a few minutes. Um, Okay, oh, I should mention who the other acid is. Acid is, uh, is uh, acetic acid, which I mentioned is vinegar. And who does that is, uh, where's my slide for that? Uh, it's not here, okay. As, uh, who does that is uh, acetic acid bacteria. And that's like no fun to have in most beers, okay? And so acetic acid bacteria, a little bit is good, a little a volatile acidity is good in beer. Uh, there'll be some in the beer, uh, the second beer we tried tonight, but, uh, and that's a good thing, but if it's too much volatile acidity, too much acetate, it's not that good. All right, so who are the players in this? And I've alluded to some of these things, so we'll come and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about them. This is what is doing the, most of the fermenting in all beers, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And, uh, and what this means, the name of this guy is sugar fungus, is his genus name, and beer is the second name. Uh, and so this is brewer's yeast, and it makes yeah, ales. Uh, and nearly every ale you drink is fermented with this yeast. And so, uh, so the beers you all are drinking now are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's wine yeast, uh, and then even wild yeast that ferment are also Saccharomyces. This is a very, very common organism. Um, there's many strains of it. It's wild in nature. And when you drink these things, you're drinking domesticated strains. And so these are strains that have been selected by humans over long periods of time. And they exhibit a lot of the properties of domestication. For example, their genome is smaller. Um, and, so, uh, and so these guys are, have been sort of the mainstay of human history. And this is a, this is a uh, 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 electro, um, electron microscope, and they reproduce by budding. And so each of these buds is a new yeast cell forming. There's a lot of this stuff in this brewery right now. <laughs> Okay, so what about some of the other critters in your beer? Um, this is called lac this one's called lactobacillus. The name means milk rodlet. Rod is the shape of the cell, and they're small, hence the let. And uh, this produces lactic acid. This is what makes yogurt sour. And so when you make yogurt at home, you heat up some milk, and then you take a scoop of yogurt and put it over there. You're doing exactly what the old brewers did. You're culturing that with a fresh batch of lactobacillus. And uh, this, this is a really common organism, and it produces a lot of the lactic acid you'll drink in beer. And we'll hear more about the application of this stuff in this brewery later. David will mention this to you. Okay, here's one called uh, Pediococcus, and it's got a funny name. It means in a plane, so flat, and then 
and then but they're round cells. Um, and so here are pediococcus cells on a filter. Uh, these also produce lactic acid uh, in high concentrations. It makes a rancid butter smell, which not cool. And uh, and it's not cool if this stuff is in your beard. David, how much of this stuff is in your brewery right now? Zero. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. Pediococcus in the now, brewery. We know people who pitch. We know people who pitch this stuff. Yeah. Um, you're not gonna catch me pitching this into my home brew. No way, Jose. So yeah, it's not here either. But it's in some sour beers. Okay, this is acetobacter, and this is what makes acetic acid vinegar. And, uh, and so these need oxygen. So what these guys do is they oxidize ethanol into uh, acetic acid. So acetic acid, in this case, is an oxidation product of ethanol. You're going from a two-carbon uh, ethanol and oxidizing it with ex uh, to make that carboxyl group to... Uh, to then make this acid. And so if anyone's ever made vinegar at home, the way you make it is to expose something with alcohol in it, wine or beer, to the atmosphere, and over time it will turn to, uh, it will turn to vinegar. Uh, a yeah, beer that is barrel aged will have a little bit of acetic acid in it because a little bit of oxygen will, will sneak through the slightly porous walls, um, but this is not something you want a whole lot of in your, in your beer. And it's not something you should ever get out of out of out of clean beer. Okay, here's a fun one. This is Britannomyces. There's a bunch of species. Uh, you'll taste a couple of them tonight. Uh, and uh, this means British fungus. And so we just switched. Before we we're talking about bacteria. Now we're talking about a yeast. Okay. And so bacteria is a group of organisms that does not have. Uh, does not have organelles. If you look inside, you can see that these things have a nucleus, um, and so this is a and so this is related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, and this guy can make acetic acid. It'll make a small amount of acetic acid, and then it makes a range of flavors that uh, define sour beer uh, when it's when it's being when it's being used, and these are the flavors. Barnyard, horse blanket, pineapple, spicy, and then my favorite, clean goat. Um, and so that's what that's what uh, that's what Britannomyces tastes like. You'll hear it get abbreviated Brett all, all the time. So if you're in a if you're in a if you're in a beer bar somewhere and you say, Oh, I'd really like your Brett IPA, then you'll score extra points with the people selling it beer. Uh, and so, but these are, but the flavors really do taste like this. David, what else do you get besides those guys? Uh, let's see, Britannomyces uh, bruxinellus and Britannomyces uh, lambicus. Yeah, yeah. Which is basically the same with a few different flavor profiles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how do we use these things to make sour, uh, uh, that, uh, how do we make these things in a sour beer? And, uh, and one method to curl sour is here. This is, uh, this is in the Comtean Brewery. Um, uh, time does not respect that who does not work for him. And, uh, just, uh, and so this is, um, this is one way to control sour beer is time. And so sour beers tend to be very old. You're going to taste one tonight that is several years old. And so, uh, and but sometimes time makes a is a is the, a way to make a beer go from oh that's undrinkable to wow that's super special. And so that's one of the proper techniques for making a sour beer. Um, but there's some there's some approaches. One is the kettle sour. We'll try one of these later. And so here, what happens is that be, when you make beer, you go from uh, the sweet, and we're not talking about how to make beer tonight, otherwise it'd be a four hour talk. Uh, and so, but you go from this sweet grainy liquid, and uh, the sweet grainy liquid, and then you add it, uh, you boil it for a while, and then add yeast, and that yeast converts, converts the starch to, or excuse me, converts the sugar to ethanol, to alcohol. And so, uh, but, but what happens is with a kettle sour, is you take these lactobacillus, um, which are, again, set like a yogurt culture. Um, some people add yogurt, that might be me. Uh, I, I assure you they don't do that here. Uh, and what you can do is you can add bacteria to the sweet malty wort and then, and then let it sit for 
24 <laughs> hours, let's say, at high temperature before boiling the before boiling the wort. And when that happens, you kill all the lactobacillus. So these critters that you really don't want in your brewery are now all dead. Uh, but they've made this very sour wort, and then boil it, and then uh, then ferment as usual, clean sourness. And you're going to try that. You're going to try that tonight. That's a very common way of making delicious beer. Another approach is what I call the garden approach. And so the garden approach is one where you add a mix of sour beer uh, cultures. And so all the bacteria I showed there, I can order, get on the internet and order pure cultures of them. Anybody can. And you can get mixed cultures. Sometimes they'll mix them for you and sell you the mixed culture. It's like, oh yeah, you want to make this lambic, here's your culture. Or you can buy them one by one. It's like going to the seed catalog and buying all the, all the, little, all the little seeds that you can use to plant your garden in the spring. And so you can do that. You can get lactobacillus. You can get Britannomyces, all the different species that David mentioned. You can even buy Pediococcus, as if somebody would do that. Um, and so you can buy all this stuff, and then you can pitch it into unfermented or fermented beer. So you can pitch it into beer that, where it's still sweet and hasn't been turned into alcohol, or you can add some clean yeast, ferment it, and then add these things. Almost often, then these beers get sent into barrels. And, uh, and then they sit in barrels for a while, let them sit for months to years. And, uh, and then you might reuse the barrel. If you do that, then it's termed untended garden because now you have whoever likes living in that barrel very well being your next, uh, being your next one. So I have an untended garden barrel at home, which at the moment needs a lot of work. Um, but, uh, but this is, we'll taste, we'll, taste one of, we'll taste one of these later. The, then there's the last is what I call the ecosystem approach. And this is spontaneous ferments. And so this is the method for Belgian lambics and American so-called cool ship ales. And I'll explain what a cool ship is in just a second. Here what happens is that, the, is that the beer is exposed to the atmosphere, and then the things that are floating through the atmosphere will become the, uh, will float into the beer and provide the inoculation for the beer. Except that it's not, it's not exactly the atmosphere. Um, it's not. And I'll come. I'll come back to that. In a, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Uh, but what happens is that you make some really amazing beers this way. So uh, deeply complex sour beers. Um, it's a very traditional way of doing it. This is the way all lambics were made, without adding any yeast, without adding any bacteria. And uh, and so here are two from Belgium, uh, from a brewery called Compagnon. And so here are two the, that we just, just just drank about six weeks ago. And then here is one, this is becoming very popular in America. And so you can get these American beers that are doing this. This is one from Tillamook, Oregon. One of my graduate students, her home is in Tillamook. And so she goes home and then she always brings me a bottle when she comes back. My favorite student, and, uh, and so here is one that here is one we here is one we drank here is one we drank recently, and so this is uh, so these are these are happening in America. They're, uh, they tend to be you'll know it when you see one because the bottles won't be twenty dollars or more, uh, and it'll be very very good. Um, and so here is this pool ship. And so here's how they here's how they here's how they start these up. And so they will pump the sweet wort up into this hot sweet wort into this copper tank. And then here are louvers that are open to the outside. The air blows in. More importantly, it's the microflora that are inside this brewery. And so the microflora in this brewery are in the walls. They're everywhere. Steam comes from this thing, it goes up, it hits the top, and then it drips back down again. And when it does drip back down, it, uh, it will land into here and it will re-inoculate that. So a lot of the inoculation is probably coming from within the brewery itself. And then they pump these things into barrels, which they do a good job of cleaning, but they're not able to get everything out. Um, and so, but they've been doing this for years and years at this one place, like 100. And so, uh, and so this culture is all there. And this is what a lot of American brewers are aspiring to do right now. Um, some with better success than others. I think that the, I think the folks from Tillamook de Gard is making some fantastic ones. And so this is, to, this is very, very difficult. Um, you throw away a lot of beer when you do this. David, how much do you, how much would, 
sour beer brewery like this throw out? Like this or yeah. like us? No, like us, not these guys. These guys probably don't throw any out because they're good at it. You but uh, but if, like, if I were to start a sour brewery, how much would I have to throw away, do you think? To start up a cool shit program, probably yeah. 90%. Yeah, okay, oh, there you go. Because it doesn't always make great beer. Okay, and so here's what happens through the time. This is why I call this the ecosystem approach, is because you have the rise and fall of different bacteria. So you have this sort of succession. So this is just like we see in ecology. See the yeast come up and then they go down. Acetic, ac acetic ac uh, acid bacteria come up and go down. Lactic acid bacteria up and down. And, and neither David or I knew what a cyclohexamine resistant yeast was. Um, <laughs> and so and this happens over over two years while things are happening in a barrel. So there's this so there's this natural progression of different types of microorganisms through times. Um, and terobacteria, these are super fun. These are what make sour beer smell like garbage. Um, they come and they go. All right, how do we sense and perceive sour beer? So how do we taste this stuff? And how would it, this will take, in, take into place uh, later as you guys get going. And so how do we sense sour? You know, it's odd, we only figured this out a few years ago. And so uh, what happens is that in your tongue, you have these protein channels, and hydrogen ions will go through that protein channel, and when it does, it will send a signal to your brain that, uh, that you're tasting sour. And so here, it's a mouse, because they luckily don't do this research on humans. They isolate these little taste buds and then figure out what, the, and what, the, uh, what these protein channels are. So essentially, you have these channels and membranes in your taste buds that allow hydrogen ions to fall through them and when it does it sends a signal. That's what's going to happen to your tongue later. Bob, was it just the isolation of that the protein channel itself in 2018? Yes, it was, it was, but they had, I mean they, they were just, I mean they had an idea that's what's happening, but not until you find it, you don't know. Um, all right, so how, when we sense, when we do sensory evaluation of sour, what are we doing? First of all, sour is a taste, it's not an aroma. This is a pet peeve I have with other beer judges who are like, this beer smells sour. No, it doesn't smell sour, it smells like vinegar, or it smells like yogurt, um, but you're not smelling sour. Sour is right there on your tongue. And so you can taste sour. If I hand you, if I hand you this right here and say, put your nose on top of that, you're gonna get this sharp amount of acetate up your nose and you're gonna know you're gonna drink vinegar. And so you know that it's gonna taste sour, so you're gonna call it sour, because that's really the thing that happens first in your mind. So it's separating your mind, uh, your aroma from taste. Um, but however, acetic acid is volatile. You will smell the vinegar. The acetate comes up and burns your nose, but you don't have taste buds in your nose. You're just getting burned by acid. <laughs> Um, and so some of the sensory descriptions that you can use, if you're smelling acetic, vinegar. That's a super straightforward one. Lactic is going to be yogurt, and so you're going to smell yogurt, sauerkraut, spoiled milk, or God forbid, diacetyl, uh, which is this butter compound. And so, so this is, these is common that you'll smell in beers with a lot of lactic acid in them. Brett, remember barnyard pineapple? Uh, and then the taste is going to be is going to be this is going to be the sense of sour on your tongue. But you should ask yourself: Is it intense? Is it tart? Is it intensely sour? Uh, is it like taking? Is it softening the enamel on your teeth? Kind of sour. And so, so, so when you taste these things, ask yourself: How intense is it? And how well balanced is it with the rest of the beer? And so, it's possible to have a sour beer be too sour. Sorry, Nanette. Um, <laughs> Um, but it can be, but it might be not sour enough too. So, so taste that when you when you when you think about it. All right. So here's the bad part of the talk. Not we don't. There's some flavors in sour beers you don't want in there, and uh, and these are really common. And so I think a lot of people think like sour beer brewing. Oh, you just throw stuff in and walk away. Don't worry about the sanitation. And they sort of, you know, and it's sort of like, it's sort of like you know, like like Jackson Pollock, like throwing paint on a, on a painting, and you too can be, a, you too can be an artist. Um, and in fact, that's not the case, because just like if you tried making Jackson Pollock, it, would, it wouldn't work. And so a lot of people, when they make sour beers, make a lot of mistakes. And so here's a big mistake. Ethyl acetate smells like nail polish. And so that's a common one in, in, in poorly made. Another one is acetaldehyde, 
which Ooh. smells like latex paint or right. the inside of a pumpkin. So this is, we just had Halloween, so maybe you all remember this. If you Wait, scrape is that the fresh pumpkin? Yes, or so fresh ones? Fresh ones. So when okay. you scrape yeah. out a pumpkin and stick your nose in, that's, really that's, that's acetaldehyde. Yeah, that's a common one. Um, <laughs> and then uh, some people call it green apple, but that doesn't work for me. I get the latex paint. And then musty basement, which is uh, trichloroanacetol, anisole, which is TCA. It's the same as cork taint. And so and I call this like walking into your grandmother's basement. And so when you're walking down creaky stairs into a basement, that musty smell, that's TCA. And uh, some sour beers will have that. And then there's this guy right here. Uh, which is a THP, and the sour brewers in the United States have started to figure out, like, oh yeah, this is in our beer. And, um, and so it smells like Cheerios at low levels, and, or it tastes like Cheerios at low levels, and then at high levels it tastes like the inside of a mouse cage. And so for, so for mouse, uh, for people who make, for people who uh, drink like biodynamic wines, wines that have sulfates, they can, sulfites, they can often taste like ma inside of a mouse cage. And that's not good, it's called mousy at those levels. Don't go there. Um, here's the best part, we won't taste any THP today, we're not gonna taste any of this stuff either. So, uh, but just so you know, if you go to a, if you go to a, some place and you get some sour beer and you don't like it, look, or, look, think about whether it's got any of these flaws. There's a host of other ones. Okay, so I'm going to pour a beer and David's going to talk about how he makes this stuff here at the brewery. Jeff. Okay, so um, from what I'm understanding, all the sour has to do with these hydrogen ions. How, how are there so, how is there such a broad spectrum of our perception of hydrogen ions? How does that work? Okay, that's a good question. So, the question was how is there a broad perception of hydrogen ions? There's a few so things A broad here. spectrum. Yeah, and so there's a few things. One is there's different organic acids, and those organic acids will present sourness in different ways. Those organic acids also, and I had to not get into this tonight because it's called Science on Tap, not Nerd on Tap. And, uh, <laughs> and so this would be, uh, th th these things, these, uh, these acids don't fully dissociate. And so a better way of measuring uh, acidity in beer is to like count up the amount of acid in by doing a, what's called an acid titration. And so the different acids present themselves in different ways and they have these different flavors. And so the sour in sour beers is just hydrogen ions but there's all these other things that you smell and taste, and there's all these different acids. There's thousands of compounds in the beer. That's like the timbre of music and the, and the actual frequency almost, I guess. If I'm not a musician, so I'm <laughs> sorry. Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay. Hans. Is there a certain ABV that you're looking for? Like if you use a champagne yeast and push it up to 14 at the beginning, would that kill all of your yeast? It'll slow them down. Bacteria? It'll slow them down and get sour. I don't know. Have you ever had a 14% sour? No. Never tried one. Yeah. I think they're going to combat each other. Those flavor compounds, you're going to get the hot, super heavy uh, alcohol content. It's going to combat that sourness. And really, like you said, you know, the sourness needs to be soft. It needs to be approachable. Yeah. If you put in that higher alcohol, and the higher alcohol, I have done the Abyss from Deschutes, I soured it. it. Took about two and a half years to get a slight sour off it. And I think they were just very much combating, or it could have been all the roasted barley in there and the chocolate barley that was overpowering, you know. But it's a more sterile environment when you have a higher alcohol. Cool. Let's save the rest of the questions to the end. And also, we have to remember that there's going to be a, there's going to be a bit of audience participation coming up. Too. <laughs> so I want to make sure we have time for that. All right, Dave, you take over. I'll be working here. So which one's the next clicker? <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, right. Gotcha. I also realize I'm too old to do that. All right, well, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, my name is David Brangard. I've worked with Flathead Lake Brewing Company for about six years now. Uh, before that, I was a brewer at Deschutes Brewery and in Bend, Oregon. Um, I worked there for 18 years, which I had the opportunity to start up their uh, sour beer program for Deschutes. So I can honestly say that I was doing sour beers before sour beers were cool. And everybody thought we were nuts, everybody thought we were crazy, and nobody knew what they were tasting, unless you went to Belgium and tasted these. So, 
we're starting to realize now that there is a popularity in sour beers. Um, so I'm going to start off the, my portion of the talk with who are these target consumers that are going to buy your beer? Because us brewers, we want to produce everything that we can produce and things that we like. But the bottom line is we need to be able to sell these beers. So how do you produce these beers? It goes hand in hand with who you're going to sell these beers to. I'd like to make clear what we talked about earlier with these cool ships. Um, dumping 90% of the beer is only the startup process of that. Because what you're trying to do is grow that microorganism within the room itself. So to get that right, it's going to take a generation, you know, of, of, of not only the bacteria, but maybe even people. So these, uh, these bacterium, these yeast cells all live within the wood. So to get that right and to get it going, especially in today's agricultural society with the pesticides, it's becoming more and more difficult to keep these um, um, cool ship rooms alive with, with clean strains of yeast and bacteria. So once you got it going, my cantaloupe, yeah, of course, you're gonna make beer after beer after beer, which is great. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about is producing sour beers in a brewery, which we are here. Um, our target consumers, our process times, and some of the equipment needs we need, uh, are going to be using. So this picture that you're seeing here is our clean brewery upstairs. If any of you have been upstairs and looked through the, uh, the barrel room windows, that's these windows here, you'll be looking down into our brewery. We try to keep this brewery as clean as possible, hence the tile floors, all stainless steel. We don't want any bacteria or any wild yeast entering this system. So first I'm gonna talk about our target consumers for sour beer. Uh, these are some friends of mine from Russian River. I only wish that I had that bottle of temptation here. These guys have been making sour beers and some of the best sour beers in the United States for about two decades now. That's uh, Vinny Caruso there. So he comes from a wine family. From his family, he was able to uh, uh, get up some of these uh, oak barrels and start doing his sour beers in oak barrels. Um, that's kind of how we do things today in most breweries. This guy pretty much invented the sour beer culture in the United States. Uh, so we're going to start, and you also see a little bit of Sierra Nevada down here, which interestingly enough, Sierra Nevada does not do sour beers. So some breweries will do sour beers, some breweries will not. And it's not a matter of whether you're brave enough, it's a matter of your cleanliness within that brewery. So some breweries absolutely will not do sour beers for fear of infecting their entire brewery. Uh, Sierra is one of those breweries. These guys on the other hand, have separate rooms, they're in love with it, and they make great beer. So your target consumers, obviously over the plank, that means the people that walk into your brew pub and want to buy beer, those are very important customers. Um, most people that come into your brewery, so let's say Flathead Lake Brewing Company, for example, you can buy these six packs out on the grocery store shelves, you can buy our main draft products in any bar in the state of Montana. So when they come into our brewery, they're gonna want something special. They're gonna want something unique. And that's where these beers really fit in. So we have a lot of people come into this brewery and say, oh, I've had your Centennial, I've had your, your Bluff Church Pale Ale. What kind of sours or what kind of oak aged beers do you have on tap? So that's a really good source. I think that every, every brew pub should have specialty beers that are not served in the grocery stores or in other pubs pubs. The sophisticated beer geeks. Now these guys are an important group, okay? <laughs> there's a lot of them out there and there's more and more out of there. And you may think these guys are nerds, but really these guys know their beers. And they also have a smartphone in their pocket. And they're on apps like Untapped. So when you're producing good beers or you're producing bad beers, these guys are going to blog about it. They're going to write internet reviews about it. These guys could really make or break your brewery, right? So the sophisticated beer geeks are the ones coming in and going, what's the newest and greatest beer you have? Sours is one of them. Um, hazy IPAs is another one coming up. So you have a lot of people coming in asking for those beers. Another good uh, target consumer is transitionary from wine to beer. Uh, sour beer has a unique aspect where there's virtually no hops in the beer. 
hops are uh, going to restrict the growth of certain bacterium and certain uh, yeast cells in the beer. So we add very little hops to the beer. There's a high acidity flavor to the beer. And typically, as you all see, these are served in stem glasses most of the time. So that makes another consumer feel more comfortable with it. So if they can taste these beers and they're like, I've had so many people come to me like, this doesn't even taste like beer. And it's like, that, that's good, especially for the wine drinkers that want to transition over into beer. It's a very good uh, transitionary um, uh, product. Bottle sales, uh, it's very important. You know, in your brewery, people will come up and they're going to want to take something home. And if they really enjoy their experience, they're going to share it with their friends back home. So sour beers age well and they don't really go bad. So putting them into 22 ounce bottles or 750 milliliter bottles is a pretty good idea. And you can also get a higher price point on that. It gives you more visibility. So again, where do, the, where do these sophisticated beer geeks shop? They shop in bottle shops. And these bottle shops love these types of beers because they obviously aren't serving um, your main corporate American beers. They're serving very unique beers. Uh, and the more unique, the better for these bottle shops. Another good thing to have on your labels when you are selling bottles is education information. Because some people will actually buy a beer and be like, this is terrible, there's something wrong with it not knowing that it's a sour beer. So that education is very important and information because not only are you gonna tell people, yes, this beer is going to be sour, we did that on purpose, it wasn't an accident. And then again, going back to the beer geeks, they're gonna say, oh, well, what kind of bacteria did you use in this? Or what kind of yeast did you use in this? Well, I don't really like Britannomyces lambicus, I prefer, you know, Britannomyces bruxinellus. So having that information on your level or, or on your label is uh, essential, um, and it gives people that information, and they can call in or they can write into the brewery and say, "I didn't love this beer," or, or if there was something wrong with it. Um, but when people say again something's wrong with it, it's usually... brewfests are very good. Uh, I always like to enter sour beers into brewfests for two reasons. One, there's not a lot of competition because of what I talked about earlier. There's not a lot of breweries that are making sour beers. A lot of breweries are afraid to make sour beers. But number two is when you win in that category, it says something about your brewery. It says that you can keep a clean brewery running and you can make sour beers. But anybody that's entering sour beers in, in, in brew fest competitions are usually making a pretty good product. So even though there's very few entries, the competition is actually pretty fierce on a small level. <coughs> so those are the people we're trying to sell sour beers to. Uh, we're gonna talk about process time. So we did talk about the different types of beers that are being made. Um, when, he, when, when Bob here was talking about the, uh, you know, the cool ships, um, spontaneous fermentation, we all have our samples. I'm gonna Everyone has a sample of Moonlight. Okay, so um, while we're talking about process times, it's the perfect time. So everybody has a sample of Moonlight right now. Okay, that is considered a kettle sour beer. And that's what you have in your hand right now. And as Bob talked about earlier, this is a very clean sour. It's made with lactobacillus, which is a bacteria, not a yeast. And it has a very rapid turnaround time for a brewery. Um, I'm just going to kind of reiterate what Bob said here. You make a what's called the wort in your brew house, and it's a fermentable product, but it hasn't been fermented yet. You sterilize that, add oxygen, layer it with CO2 inside your kettle, and, and inoculate it with this lactobacillus. And not just home brewers use uh, yogurt. I know some other breweries that throw in like tubs of Nancy's yogurt to get this inoculation going. Uh, which to me is crazy. We buy a, uh, a lacto strain out of um, a... Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, out of a, uh, a yeast uh, production facility, White Labs. So. so the kettle sour goes over pretty quick. So what you're tasting here is a, is a nice clean sour. And what was mentioned on the um, slides earlier, this is tart not necessarily sour yes it's sour but it's tart 
So what happens with this lactobacillus is it becomes very one-dimensional, where it, it's just clean tartness, and the rest is like balance, and usually people are balancing <coughs> out uh, these types of beers with fruit, and in this case, it's plums. So in the kettle, you, you get that wort in there, you inoculate it with this lactobacillus, and for us, it takes about 15 hours. And you're just watching for a certain pH drop in that beer, um, and then you'll know that it's created enough of that lactic acid. Then you boil it and sterilize it, and it goes off into your regular cellar for normal fermentation. So it really, other than the 15 hours of souring, doesn't take any longer than a regular ale that's going through your process. What's appealing about this is it's, it's not expensive, it's not time consuming, and if you can do it right and you can do it consistently, you can can beers like this. So Flathead Lake Brewing Company is one of the only breweries, I think the only brewery in the state, that's making a year-round available sour beer in cans. And, and that's, that's the Moonlight Paddle. Yeah. And you can buy it out in grocery wow. stores if you look for it. <laughs> it's good. It is good. Um, and then for the next sample, we'll be talking about this oak age. So if we're, if we're going down that path, I can uh, talk about spontaneous really quick. Spontaneous fermentation, the second type. This is what, uh, what Bob was talking about, about cool ships. This is, a, I think, the second fastest fermentation time. So these cool ships... They're very old. The process of brewing into cool ships was a necessity. It's not a, a modern day invention. Um, just a really brief history of these cool ships. Beers were being brewed by farmers on farms, okay? And they put their fermentation vessel, their cool ship, up in the attic of their barns. Um, when it was time to brew it was usually when the fruit was becoming ripe for several reasons. There's a lot of yeast in the air when the fruit is ripening, and then you're gonna have that fruit to put into the beer and the finished product. So they'd open up these louvers in their barns, all these yeasts from the fields that they were uh, farming in and growing fruit in would come in through these levers, fall into the, uh, fall into the wort, and spontaneously ferment these beers. And as they did that for generations and generations and generations, these wild yeasts now live within the wood in that barn and fall back <coughs> into that ward. Um, today, if you're gonna do spontaneous fermentations, it's a little bit different because most people don't have these, you know, 200 year old um, cool ship rooms. So spontaneous fermentation today is you buy lab yeast and uh, Britannomyces most likely. And, you know, the best way to do it would be take one of these barrels, flip it up on its end, cut the top out of it, and put your ward in there to about this height and then just inoculate it and let it go. But it takes some temperature. You gotta have a temperature control room to do that or just do it in the summer when your temperatures are hovering right around 70 degrees. I don't know a lot of people in Montana that are doing spontaneous fermentations, but we do see this a lot in Oregon and California. Uh, it is also one of the most dangerous ways to do it because like I said, as that fermentation is happening, all these, uh, during the front, it's a kind of, you know, rough process where it's just like rolling and blowing off all these yeasts all over the place. So if you were to do it in your main brewery, you know, it's gonna get all over everything, all over every piece of equipment, every hose. So usually spont spontaneous fermentations are happening either outside or in a separate facility. The most common American way to, uh, to make sour beers, which is the one that's being passed around right now, and this is uh, oak age souring in barrels. And that's what you see happening down here. So what we do with this is we produce a beer, send it through the natural or the regular uh, fermentation regimen, which is produce the wort in the brew house, send it down to fermentation, and ferment the beer out with uh, Saccharomyces yeast, which is our regular house strain that all your ales are made off of. You want to put in a little bit of unmalted wheat or oats, something that has um, a little bit of unfermentable sugars in there. So once it's done fermenting, then you're going to transfer that wort into your oak barrels, take your Britannomyces, and inoculate each barrel with uh, about a liter of this uh, yeast propagation. Sit in these barrels for about a year in the right temperatures, pull it out, 
and you're going to have a sour beer. What's interesting about this with that flavor chart that Bob just had up here is that you'll put the beer in these barrels, inoculate it with Britannomyces, and you'll be tasting these barrels, and it's just bad, 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 and then suddenly it turns this corner where it starts producing acetic acid and uh, lactic acid, and then these beers really develop. But if you let them sit, because they're open to oxygen, oxygen is, it is going through the wood and through the bunghole, it's gonna turn into vinegar if you don't catch it. So tasting is everything when you're doing that. Uh, another example would be, uh, what you have to do with these barrels is blend them. So you're gonna do four, bar usually four of the same kind, and then taste them and, and pull out any of the bad barrels. I've had probably maybe six bad oaks in my whole life. And so we buy this oak off of wineries and don't really know where the oak's coming from or why they're get rid of, get rid of, uh, getting rid of these. So they may be infected with Pediococcus, they may be infected with the Cedioobacter, and you'll know it after a year. And if it is that case, then you can adopt the beer and get rid of that barrel. So everybody have a sample of their, uh, it's called a Woods Bay Pale Ale. So that's real sour there. Not really sour, but the flavor is real sour. It's not tart, right? And there's a lot more complexity going on in a beer like this. So when you use these yeast strains instead of bacteria, so what I'm saying is if you use Britannomyces instead of Lactobacillus, you get a much more complex beer. Anybody get clean goat out of it? <laughs> Not that much experience with <laughs> this is actually pretty clean for Britannomyces beer. There's not a lot of horsiness. There's not a lot of um, uh, Britannomyces lambicus, uh, dirty sweat socks. There's not a lot of that going on this beer. Like a pineapple guava. Yeah, like a pineapple guava. So you say, that, you say that in that you wish it had more? Uh, not necessarily. You know. My, my taste with sour beers have kind of backed off a little bit, and I like the more balanced sour beers than the super in-your-face sours. But yeah, I would like to see some more clean goat in this. That's Bob, it was on his slide. Um, so again, when you go back to these uh, cool ships and spontaneous fermentations, fruit availability was always the issue. So you're brewing when the fruit's available. Today, uh, sourcing our fruit through um, certain companies, we can get aseptic fruit puree year round. So the fruit availability doesn't really um, dictate how or when we're gonna brew. Um, we have chosen to use some of, uh, some of the local fruit around here. Sarah, who's serving up here tonight behind the bar. We get cherries from her grandfather's orchard down in Yellow Bay. But, you know, again, she doesn't have it, but if you just buy them randomly, you have to be careful about those uh, pesticides and, mm -hmm. and, and What's the fertilizers. What's the fruit in the woods bay? What's that? What's the fruit in the woods bay? Uh, Sarah, what fruit did we add to that? Do you remember? <coughs> what was the fruit in that woods bay? Blackcurrant. 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 Got time a little bit here? Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through this pretty quick uh, with some of the, the, the equipment that you need. So for everybody that's seen our brewery up here, what we have new within this room down here is this little sour room back here behind the windows that I hope everybody noticed. And that's what this room is with the red walls. So what we're able to do is, is get back into doing these Britannomyces beers, but we have to be very careful about keeping it away from our main brewery upstairs and that's why we have it down here so again i'm going to go back to these three types of beers that i talked about kettle sours is pretty easy you just have to propagate up some lactobacillus and have a sealed kettle door in your brew house there's not a lot to it and a co2 source and be super thorough in your cleaning uh, spontaneous fermentation means you have to have one of those cool ships which again is that 
big, long, shallow bathtub for spontaneous fermentation. And then that has to happen in a separate room, preferably with wood beams and cobwebs and all sorts of things <laughs> down there, which is, which is wow. truly the, the culture that's falling back into that. Uh, oak aging, which is what we're doing back here. You gotta have the oak barrels, which you source from wineries. What I do with oak barrels is uh, we'll, we'll get the wine barrels from wineries and then we'll use it for clean beer for three uses, something like um, barley wine or strong saison or something like that. After its third use, then they go down to the sour room and get inoculated with wild yeast. But you're going to want to have a separate room for that. And then blending becomes an issue when you're starting to do oak age barrels because each barrel is going to produce a different beer depending on what was in there previously or what bacteria or yeast is still alive in there. Believe it or not, these bacteria and yeast live several inches within the wood. So even if you dump 180 degree water in there, you still may not kill everything all the way through that wood. And something like Pediococcus, as we've learned, all learned tonight, I hope, is something you don't want in your brewery. So if you get these barrels in and they have Pedio in them, or Acidiobacter in them, you're gonna to wanna to try to kill it, but you may not try, you may not be successful in killing that. So, barrels, barrels, barrels. A lot of work goes into barrels, but at the end of the day, it's super worth it. Um, anything aged in oak barrels, I absolutely love. Even if it's not sour beer, it's clean beer, like <coughs> our, uh, our Imperial Stout that we get from Whistling Andes, and we get bourbon barrels from those guys, you know? And you put a really strong stout in there. It, you want to get just enough wood flavor, not overpowering, but just enough to make it complex. Use a new barrel. <laughs> Use a new barrel. A new barrel is good. Um, it almost comes out too oaky. Mm. So new barrels, there's going to be too much oak in your beer. But and you can control. That. You can control it with time, absolutely. Um, another way to do it is to use stainless steel tanks and actually put staves in there, mm -hmm. which is one, one, one thing I did at Deschutes Brewery. So if you, if you don't have the, the space to do you know, a bunch of oak barrels, you can actually build a stainless steel rack inside a bright beer tank and hang staves inside that tank. And then you can really control the wood by how old are these staves, what use of staves are these, and how many staves are you putting in. Home brewers will use wood chips within carboys, which are kind of get the same thing. All right, what do you guys taste in these beers? Time to make you the presenter. <laughs> I like curve. Oak in the barrel age, here. Definitely, yeah. A little bit of leather. Leather. Good one. Pineapple. Pineapple. That's Britannomyces. Yep. Classic breath flavor. Yeah. What about preferences? So the. the the lactobacillus, the moonlight paddle that you had first, or the second one that's a little bit more sour and oaky? I like the first one. Second one. Okay. So let's do like a show of hands here. So first, moonlight paddle. Nice, clean, sour beer you can buy in cans is pretty good. And then who likes the uh, second one a little bit better? Yeah, that's about 50-50. I had two of them, but they get better. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Um, so, any questions about the little presentation that I put on here before I hand the microphone back off to uh, Bob? I have a question on your, to keep everything clean, do you have special filters in your HVAC systems or special separate HVAC systems in your room back there? There is a separate HVAC system back here. So we, we blow everything outside from this room so it doesn't get pulled back into the brewery with recycled air. And then temperature is key. So we have a separate heater in that room that's independent from the rest of the brewery. So we're gonna keep that room at a nice 70 to 75 degrees for these uh, sour beers to develop. Kind of the warmer, the better. Most beer ferments about 65 degrees. So. As far as we're concerned, yeah, it, it's, it's a complete separate system. Another thing of importance is that any equipment that's being used in that room never goes back up to the brewery. 
and that includes the boots that the that the brewers are going to be using. So change your boots before you go in. Leave the boots behind when you go back up to the main brewery. Yeah, get a contamination suit and a shower. I don't think we're going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Dave, sourdough bread has a culture, and you maintain the culture and you grow it and it lasts for a mm -hmm. long time. So, do you preserve the cultures that you're making the beer from to continue to use over time like you do with sourdough bread? Uh, sometimes, yeah. So, for clean beers up in the main brewery, we certainly reuse our yeast. And we're looking at them under a microscope and we're making sure these yeasts are healthy. Now, when it comes to sour beers, you can or you cannot. A lot of times what I've done is don't empty the barrel of the beer, but don't flip it upside down and drain it and just re-add beer to it. I've had marginal success with that. Um, usually the... the they aren't that healthy at that point. If they've been sitting around for 12 months or 18 months, you really don't have a, a great culture at the bottom of there. But I've also heard that people love these beers like uh, Rodenbach Grand Cru out of Belgium. And they'll pour that beer off so slowly, get all the beer off, and then you get a little bit of this uh, yeast at the bottom, and they'll propagate that up and make sour beers out of it. So they are, they are pretty resi resilient, but if you're trying to make difference between home brewers and production brewers is that we want nice, healthy, predictable fermentations. So so typically we're going to buy a, a, a new for Tanner Mice's crop every time. I will, I will steal a Contillon culture out of a bottle I have. Uh -huh. But I'm going to make five gallons and if it doesn't work, that's okay. Are you seeing any breweries go to like a single barrel release kind of system instead of doing mixing? Yeah, yeah, you can. And, and I've released single barrels before, but again, when, when you talk about production brewing, you want to ensure that you're going to actually have something at the end of the day. So doing one barrel, you could or you could not. You know, it might be sour, it might not be sour. And so again, this comes back to blending, right? So if you let something go too far, or it's got a bunch of acetobacter, or you know, it tastes like vinegar, that's okay too. You set that barrel aside, right? So in the future, you have a, a, a batch of beer that's coming out that's not quite sour enough. So now you can take this super sour vinegar and blend it back in and make a perfect beer out of it. So yeah, people do do single barrels, especially in Montana, I've seen it a lot. Um, but for, for all, all purposes, I would say do more than one. Um, David, question about the, the quarantine, for lack of a better word, the whole, the whole process that you do. Um, that's an advantage for those who want to take that leap to produce a sour. Um, but part of the uncontrollable factor are the barrels that you get from that vendor. Mm -hmm. um, why do wine people get rid of barrels? I mean, what, what's their motivation to turn a barrel? Because they are aged, they help the wine process. Yeah. Most wineries are only going to use the barrel one use. Really? Yeah, they're oh, usually yeah. a one use time on the barrels and they need to get rid of them somehow. Um, they, like, they like the oak flavor. Yeah, and they're really seeking that oak flavor. But I always wonder, I always ask myself, why are you getting rid of this barrel? Because I'm always in the back of my head. Is it infected with something like you aren't telling me about? You get $200 a barrel. And they get $200 a barrel for them, yeah. There's nothing that sort of controls that that says you have to declare. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So rinsing, and uh, it hasn't happened that often, but definitely a CEO back to the initiative for me. I, I've had that come through in a bunch of wine barrels. So I'm not sure which of you this question is for, but um, the, this evening's presentation has relied on uh, modern chemical ways of describing these processes, you know. Hydroxyls, and you know the various the various names of the species and the organisms that that you you guys understand to contribute to the to all these subtleties that you know go from a specific thing to like a clean goat. Um, my question is, how did people talk about this 200 years ago? Is there is, is there good is there good historical record of how people talked about this? chemistry which wasn't 
you know, I mean, carbon was like identified in an element as like what 1804 or something. I mean, how how, how do people you know start about, about this? this sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I love this subject because you know, before microscopes, before chemistry, before physics, how was it? You know, and so you got to wonder why most of these monks were doing the brewing. <laughs> Seriously, because they believed it was an act of God. They truly believed it was an act of God. And if you went and said, oh, no, 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 there's these single-celled organisms that are floating around everywhere that come in and consume these sugars and convert them into alcohol and CO2, you were headed for the guillotine. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was a religious experience. It, it truly was a gift from God for meditation. Because yep. <laughs> they had absolutely no understanding of what was happening. They understood, like, yeast, so this stuff makes this. Yeah. But they had no idea what was really happening. Mm -hmm. But they were, able to, they were able to develop a vocabulary and a procedure that produced something that at least approximated consistency. I mean, that's, that would form the tradition on which you guys... Sure, it did. did, but because they were doing spontaneous fermentations, it was consistent right. because they used the same methodology every time. And they were making one beer. They weren't and they were making make one beer, one, one time a year, <laughs> and it was like magically making itself. And you just, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then you wait, and then you get this. Yeah. Bob, do you have a different insight on that? Uh, well, with the spontaneous, for sure, but a lot of the, a lot of the beers are made by backslopping. So you take a little bit of the goods from the previous beer, put it into the next beer, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, like like making sourdough bread, and, and and they would continue to do that. The problem is there's not good notes as to what these beers tasted like, and so there's current dissent as how much of this beer is sour. For sure of it, for sure, lots of it is more sour than what we're drinking. But some of it might have been fine. And so some of the Norwegian farmhouse, some of the Kandak yeah, you know, they ferment yeah, these things with the cultures, and they're still doing it. And so, and so the way that people are able to sort of look back in time is to look at some of these new, uh, the, these old brewing cultures that are still doing the exact same thing they did before intervention of modern microbiological methods. And and yet we still really can't say for sure that they taste the same as they did, even though they're doing the same thing because. The ecology of the place where they're making yeah. it could change. We don't know. We don't know. All right, there's only one more slide, and that's just a summary here, and we'll continue to do the questions. And so, what's to learn tonight? This is all I have to do. Sour beer is good and it's tasty, and we amend it this way. Uh, we can link microbiology to the flat flavors and understand the process. And so that's what a lot of what you heard tonight, a lot of what David mentioned to you. And then part of the appeal, this is getting after your question, is the natural and uncontrollable ecological processes that, 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 that create this beverage. And so part of the fun is the, is the part that is out of the brewer's hands. So those barrels back there, they're not totally under your control. One of those fermenters upstairs, you bet. Yeah, yeah. It's doing whatever David and says so, to do right now. But even then, you just, you know, it's so dependent on temperature, it's so dependent on that particular barrel, you really don't know what you're going to get out of these barrels at the end of the day. So I have a question that leads, that stems off of that. So we, ha you know, there's amazing technologies available to tell you what's in those barrels through either DNA, fatty acids, sure. whatever. So is there a... Uh, increasingly technologically advanced uh, process being formed as these technologies become uh, not prohibitively expensive. Do you so, know? Do you know what the price is on a mass gas spectrometer right now? Well, the instrument. Yeah. yeah. I do. Well, yeah. But I also so have I a mean, sample to send in is not that much. Right. So, I right. Mean, if you got, if you're talking two hundred bucks for a. Uh, $200 for the oak cast or the cast that you think might be suspect and another hundred dollars to test if there's what a, a, name your name your name contaminant your compound, bacteria yeah. and you know that DNA exists you could test for it is that is that happening or is it mostly still this trial by error kind of approach I think companies like to shoot do test for that mm -hmm. certainly because they actually own one of those right. um, sending it off <laughs> to outside testing you know I think with breweries our size and smaller it's really up to the brewer's taste identifiers and say, you know, because really at the bottom of the line, you know, Acetobacterus in small quantities is good. Pediococcus in small quantities is great. You don't want to bring it into your brewery, but it can taste really, really good, right? Can you so, just smell the barrel? No, usually not, yeah. Not if it's dry. 
So we talk in medium toast, light toast. Yeah, uh, I, I like I like light and medium toast. Yeah, sure. I use a, a heavy toast for imperial stouts and stuff like that. But for sour beers, it's typically wine, light to medium toast. Yeah. Um, going back to what you're saying, I, I really think it comes down to the brewer tasting the beers and saying, is this good? Is this what I was going for? Am I okay personally with releasing this beer? I, I, I totally agree with him. There's some, there's some research going on in metagenomics of the things in beer, but I think you could do that till you turn silly. The best way to, to assess your beer is with your nose. Yeah. 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 What's the, I'm trying to understand the role of the fruit, because when I, I love sour beer, but I'm not always getting to this, the fruit profile, like you use black currant in that with bay, and I would never come up with that. I know. So what is the historical context of using the fruit? What's the role of the well, fruit in the whole thing? With these slow fermentations, it, it seems to me like you get a lot of fruit flavors out of these if you do them right anyway. And that tartness, it may not actually be fruit, but it may taste like a underripe nectarine or something, right? Or this pineapple that's coming through. So adding fruit, it just complements that sourness. And it kind of offsets the acidity. And if you use the right fruit with the right acidity, it really works as a complement. So traditional Belgian beers are using um, uh, Creek, which is cherry. Yeah or uh, frambos, which is your raspberry. And those two seem to be the most popular fruit styles going into beers. Now I've tasted some pretty good apricot sours and peach mm -hmm. sours, but those are a little bit too sweet for my preference. So these tartar, you know, complementary fruits in low doses. Remember, everything in beer is about balance. So you don't actually want the beer to taste like the fruit, you just want it to like complement the flavors that are already there. Why Belgium? So it seems like we have to get cultural uh, sour beers and uh, you got to go to Belgium to taste them. Uh, it's like, you know, a, a two hour drive to the Netherlands or a three hour drive to Germany where you have these uh, seemingly you don't have those cultural sour uh, sort of long, I mean, long history of making these things anyway. So, what is it in particular about? either the Belgium climate or microbiome, or is it just that they've been doing it and they still have their cement you know, cooling tubs out and that's why, or is it, what's, what makes Belgium special? I think it's the latter. It's the, it's, it's a very small part of Belgium where they're doing this, but I think it's just a very localized bit of, of beer making, sort of like a certain cheese might only come from this valley, not that valley. And so this is just a localized bit of beer making. Uh, if it weren't for this explosion in craft beer, it's a good chance that there would be zero Lambert breweries right now. So in the, in the 80s, Cantillon was doing very, very badly. And there was very few Lambic blenders. And, and uh, there's been this sort of resurgence in these art artisanal beer styles. And so essentially, it was a, a nearly extinct artisanal beer style that, that kind of got revived. And then other places just have other cultures, just like different cheeses, different, different, um, uh, different uh, foods, and so that's that's why. And so Germany is a completely different beer culture; it's all lager. And then once the boundaries of the country go up, then the then the things stay inside. They stay inside the, those culture. Those 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 uh, cultures stay inside the country. You know, so just as pilsners come from Czech Republic and. And you know, classic lagers come from Germany, and uh, you know, stouts and porters come from England. It, it, Belgian just—that's what they grew <coughs> into. That's what they made. That's what people expected. And like I said, these are generational. I mean, I'm not talking like three generations, but like ten generation brewers that are brewing in the same fields, the same you know equipment. Maybe not ten, but as their as their great grandfathers were using. And they haven't changed much at all. I was showing you that book on creeks and lambiques. You look at this equipment that these people are using, you're like, holy cow, man. And those cobwebs over, I'm not kidding. Wow. Those are meant to be there. They will not touch that. That's, wow. Yeah. They maintain a fleet of cats at Cantillon, and the cats are there to take care of all the mice because under no circumstances would these guys add any poison to their brewery. They just wouldn't do it. And so they don't use insecticides, they don't do anything. And so each brewery is a little mini ecosystem. In this case, the top predator is cats. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Then it calls them lambic kitties. <laughs> <laughs> How much of the pineapple taste in pineapple comes from bacteria that are growing on the pineapple? So there was no pineapple on those beers. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, I'm not talking about beer. I'm talking about yeah. pineapple, right? So is it, is it, do we know much about the flavor profiles of bacteria can insinuate on things that they happen to be growing on? No? I don't. <laughs> Did you have a question? You wanted to I saw your hand go up. Yes. All right, Jim always gets the last question. <laughs> Two questions. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, one for David, one for Bob. So for Bob, what is your favorite fermenting micro? And for David, what is your favorite river? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna have to, I, I, I'll keep with the theme tonight and say Britannomyces, and it's because it's a micro. Species? Oh, <laughs> I'm using Britannomyces brusselensis at home right now, and so it uh, and so it it is uh, Lambicus makes more of a cherry pie flavor. This thing is more classic <laughs> like pineapple, and I like it because of the complexity that you get. And so if you ferment a beer with ale yeast or lager yeast, the whole idea is to not have it be that complex so the ingredients can show up. And so nobody really loves a clean ale yeast other than that it works well. Um, but, uh, but, but, but if you want something to give a lot of character, I think, I think you get more character out of Britannomyces uh, broxolensis than any other micro, more complexity. I'm going to second him on that, that's my favorite also. And as far as my favorite river goes, yeah, you it's a use that. Out interesting the river. Uh, a question to ask, but it's for <laughs> the end of the night. Um, me and my beautiful wife here, we just got married about three weeks ago in Hawaii and had a reception here. Uh, so John came up with this idea this year. Oh, I got this friend that owns this little single engine plane. Let's fly into the Bob Marshall Wilderness and land at the Schaefer Meadows. Which was an awesome experience. So we took off out of here, out of Ferndale, flew over the Rocky Mountains, and land in this little meadow out in the middle of nowhere. Drops us off. We got to fly rods in our tent, and there goes the plane. So I'm going to say my new favorite river is the Middle Fork of the Flathead. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. We'll stay around, have a little more beer if you want to chat. Yeah. But thank you for showing up. Thank you guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.